Okay, welcome back to school, guys. So we got two weeks to go, and the plan is for you guys to finish up what you've been working on um, and drop some things off at school so I can get a jump on firing them before we're back in the building next week. But for today, <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about aesthetics. And if you remember from last um, year or whenever you took ceramics one, um, we defined like six theories of aesthetics and two of them, the last two, the open concept and instrumentalism, um, I'm sorry, institutionalism, um, dealt with um, uh, what people think when they're looking at artwork as opposed to what the artwork actually looks like. <clears throat> so in ceramics too, to kind of build on that, we talk about critical theories. So what is a critical theory? Um, a critical theory is uh, usually um, something that has to do with the person's background, their story, what um, they um, have experienced as an artist uh, or as a person. Um, and the critical theory <clears throat> defines how they view the art world. So it would go back to that institutionalism idea there, um, but also have to do with the open concept because we recognize that there are many different ways that we can look at a piece of art. So usually a critical theory has two parts. One, it recognizes that there are parts of the art world that aren't necessarily fair or things that aren't good about the art world. And that's why it's a critical theory because it's starting by pointing out a disparity in the way art is viewed in society or has been. Now, if you just stop there, you would only be critical. So the theory part of it has to do with the second part of a critical theory which is to propose some sort of a solution to the problem that's been defined in the first part of the critical theory. So there's a problem, and then here's a way that we can fix that. So some famous critical theories, and there are many, I'm gonna give you three, um, would include Marxism, multiculturalism, and uh, feminism. Uh, Marxist aesthetics has to do with the monetary value of um, a work of artwork. And for years, people associate how much something is worth with the quality of that piece. A Marxist says that that's kind of a bad way of looking at a piece of artwork, because if only rich people can afford to purchase a piece of artwork, then therefore that wealth is defining the quality of the piece. So a Marxist uh, aesthetician would say that if you can make artwork that doesn't have anything to do with money, then you are creating a level playing field for everybody else. This is a piece by um, an artist, uh, Holy cow, I'm forgetting his name right now. Andy Goldsworthy. <laughs> Shoot. Uh, but uh, Andy Goldsworthy would go out into nature and use the things that he could find at any sort of site um, to construct sculptures. Um, so, for example, this piece, he probably went out into nature and then by bending these sticks, built this arch structure that when photographed, in water, as it is here, creates this beautiful sort of um, target kind of uh, uh, image with the reflection on the water. And of course, once he's done building it, um, he takes a photograph and then he leaves. So he's not completely getting away from the money part because you could sell the photographs, um, but the piece itself could only be experienced in that time period or if you happen to stumble upon it, um, which very few people probably did. And a lot of his pieces are um, very temporary in that soon after he leaves, the wind could pick up and the sticks would start to fall or the uh, water could move and the sticks would start to fall. So it's a very temporary 
sort of installation that he's creating here. Feminist aesthetics um, has to do with the fact that um, for um, years and years, men seem to dominate the art world. Um, the people who own galleries seem to be men. The people who wrote uh, textbooks seem to be men. And the artists that they chose to include in those galleries and those textbooks also seem to be men. So um, the challenge was, how do you create artwork that isn't something that leans towards the traditions that were built by those men who were creating the art world um, that women were trying to be successful in. So they set out to make a whole new art world that really focused on things that women had done for generations, but maybe hadn't been thought of as high art or fine art. So this piece is by uh, Judy Chicago with a team of artists. And in creating this uh, piece with uh, another famous artist, Miriam Shapiro and their team, um, they created a group project, which was something that was different than the sort of standard that we had uh, placed on the art world that um, an artist goes into a studio, creates something, and then reveals it to the world later, and it is his or her, but in most cases his, creation. So they worked together, and they made a piece called The Dinner Party. And The Dinner Party was a um, table in the shape of a triangle, as you can see here, that where people were invited, women, from history um, who had made a significant contribution to women's roles in society or in the art world. And each placemat, each setting, table setting, each plate um, was designed specifically for that woman. Um, one side of the table is uh, uh, the history of women before um, the rise of Christianity. Um, one side of the table was um, uh, what happened from the birth of Christianity to the modern day. And then the third side of the table was uh, women who were going to make a contribution to um, society um, in the future um, or going into the future because this was a good um, 60 years ago uh, now. Um, now, whatever your feelings are about Christianity, um, their, their feeling was that women were sort of revered before Christianity, um, and then they were sort of subjugated to um, bias um, after. And so that's why they chose that um, as a focal point of this piece. If you look, there are tiles that this is sitting on, um, and what they decided was after coming up with their initial list of women that they would include 999 other women whose names are written on the tiles that the table sits at. Now, of course, creating a social gathering, that was something that was maybe thought of as a more feminine um, uh, aesthetic. Um, setting a table, um, pottery, um, textiles, all of these things um, get away from your sort of standard art forms that were um, thought to be um, something that you needed to master to become an artist like sculpture or painting. Um, so they were trying to break down what materials were thought of as art and what kind of activities were thought of as art and push art towards things that women were thought to be um, gifted at, we shall say. Um, the piece itself um, didn't uh, uh, wasn't displayed more than just a couple of times when it first was uh, created. Um, because of its size, as you can imagine, look at it. Um, but pieces from it were displayed. But only about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, um, they built a special room at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, Sackler Center for Feminist Art, where you can go see this piece in its entirety now. And the exhibition would include things like invitations um, that they designed as well, and other pieces that the women came together to build, to like make this big state. Last one is multicultural. Um, and multiculturalism focuses on the problem, let's say, that Western art um, seemed to be conceived or 
perceived as more advanced than other art forms or object making from around the world. Um, so here I have an example of an African mask, and I have a few African masks in my house as well. I've always thought they were interesting, probably because I like Picasso's paintings and in many of his paintings, uh, but some in particular, um, he featured the kind of imagery that you would find in these African masks. Now the African masks that are in my house, I have no idea what they were used for. And a multiculturalist would say that you need to know that, you know, that uh, an African mask was never intended to be hung on the wall as decoration or hung in a museum to be observed and studied, but instead used in a ritual, perhaps, uh, or some sort of social gathering. So to really judge or value that mask, you need to know what it's for and that we should all spend some time trying to figure out where meaning comes from for the artist as opposed to assigning our own meaning to it just based on what we know about art from our education. Um, so in thinking about that, I'm going to introduce two new terms to you. One is universalism and the other is uh, pluralism. So uh, a universalist is sort of an old fashioned way of looking at art that doesn't take into account the many critical theories, including the three that I just explained um, uh, in, in determining its value. Um, so um, a universalist um, does not do that. Um, a universalist believes that there is one set of rules that define what good is in the art world. You could think of things like craftsmanship or even something as simple as the use of color or brushstroke in the painting, surface and technique in uh, ceramics. Um, however, um, those sets of rules apply to everyone, whether you're looking at uh, a painting or the African mask. So a universalist might look at young Timmy's painting and think not about Timmy, at all and recognize that he's a young kid making a painting so we should look at it differently than if he were an adult um, uh, whereas a pluralist which would be the opposite end of the spectrum would take into account that timmy is a kid um, or that timmy comes from uh, cincinnati or that timmy comes from ghana or timmy comes from the philippines or timmy comes from a single parent household, um, or that uh, Timmy um, uh, feels really strongly about uh, Valentine's Day. And so he's used pink to make the sky. Um, so a pluralist tries to seek out more information about the artist before they have any opportunity or give themselves any opportunity to make a judgment about the work itself. And therefore, they have to know a lot of different ways of looking at artwork, which goes back to the open concept. So I think sometimes we're all universalists and we don't think about the artist at all. We just look at the piece and make up our own mind. And I think in a way, that's not a bad thing. You know? However, I do think that there are times when we should, you know, and then, it would be good for us to learn more about aesthetics and the kind of art that's being made all around the world by all sorts of different kinds of people in order to get a better understanding of whether or not that piece is a quality piece. So critical theories can help us understand why people do what they do and therefore think more about how we determine value in a piece. So, what do I want you to do this week? I want you, I'm going to move this up, uh, to assume that I am a pluralist, uh, that I want to know a little bit more about the artist before I judge a piece of artwork. We all know that Mr. Walter has a universalist streak, and when I look at your work, I think of it in uh, a way that uh, um, I have come to associate with quality ceramics or sculpture. Okay? 
So I want you to assume that that's not the case this time. I want you to create a Google slide with an image of a piece you've created this semester. Now it could be something that you really like, or it could be just something that works for the assignment. But what I want you to include on that Google slide is an explanation of why I, as a pluralist, should look at it a different way than I am typically used to looking and judging a piece of artwork. So you cannot, I do not want you to talk about the craftsmanship. I don't want you to talk about the effort that you put into the piece or something like improvement, that this is better than what I've done before, because those are the sorts of things that we look at all the time. So is there a story about this piece that has to do with you in some way or your background? Um, if you can't think of a reason for any one of your pieces, maybe you could look at one of your pieces and say, here's what I could do to this piece that would make you think of it in a different way where I wouldn't be as focused then on things like craftsmanship, effort, or improvement. Put that Google slide into the uh, assignment uh, um, and modules, and uh, that is your task for the week, along with anything else that you have to get ready to finish off all of your assignments. So I'm going to escape out of this and stop this recording at this point. And I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day.